There is a fifth dimension, beyond that is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space, and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area that we call the crack cellar. Put on your big Hollywood sunglasses and light the torch, because it's cellar time. Welcome to the Crack Cellar. As the prophecy was foretold, I'm Two-Spirit Penguin Daniel. And I'm Broadcaster Nichols. And today, we preview yet another remake. This time, Raccoon City is getting butt-fucked once again by Nemesis. I hope they brought a lot of lube. Resident Evil 3 Remake, coming out April 3rd, 2020. Broadcaster Nichols, I know you have scoured the internet for every little morsel this game can provide. Tell me, what are your opening thoughts? I'm really concerned about my uh, my boy Oliviera. It looked like they turned him into a high school scene kid. I swear <laughs> to God. <laughs> Watching the trailer. I did a double take. When he introduces himself in the trailer, he literally has like that typical scene kid hair swoosh back. He goes, what? <laughs> like, that's exactly how he sounds. <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> like, that <laughs> was the not characters. the Carlos from the original game at all. I know they, I know the graphics have developed quite a bit, but I'm pretty damn sure that is not the look they were going for. Yeah, all the characters seem to have been modernized. Uh, Jill being the most so. When, when you first saw how Jill looked in that trailer, how far down did your mouth drop? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, not nearly as much as when I saw. It tiffa for the first time but you know it's up there i'm just like oh my god (laughs) so then what do you think about the the new character designs in general so you've already commented on some of them you weren't really feeling overall (laughs) well you don't really play as carlos he's just the character in the game right you play as jill Mm -hmm. the whole game but when I saw him in the trailer, it was just a complete, unless that's a different character, but his face was recognizable enough. When I saw him, I was like, that has to be Carlos. That has to be based on all the other characters. I saw Nikolai in the trailer and I saw um, Barry or something like that, I think. Yeah. I'm not sure, but I, as soon as I recognized that guy, I was just like, that is Carlos. What the hell? And then his, they actually said something. I was like, he's like a fucking high schooler. <laughs> Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, the Jill the new Jill outfit, like it gave me I guess flashbacks of Mass Effect Andromeda. Just the the look that they gave her, it just felt kind of like it was hitting the oh, what's that thing that they call where it's a little bit it's all it like fucks with your perception because it's not quite real and not quite fake. Oh. Yeah, I think it was her jawline. Yeah, if it I'm was, really thinking back to it, there was something odd about like the actual curvature of her face yeah, in that uncan- scene. It, uncanny yeah. Valley. That's what I was thinking of. <laughs> so, so we were like really deep in the Uncanny Valley in like the 2000s with animated 3D modeled movies, and then it kind of got better in those. But then we entered the Uncanny Valley again for video games in like around 2008 to 10, and we've basically fixed it modern wise like if you think about all the great games have come out in the last five six years other than mass effect andromeda most of them have kind of fixed that issue where they're not really in the uncanny valley anymore and i think they actually stepped some things back to fix it i don't think they actually stepped forward i think they took a step backwards to fix it because i think they were being a little too ambitious with their the way they were creating these models and it created that effect that i'm talking about that i'm seeing with jill and i saw in mass effect andromeda a lot. <laughs> well andromeda was a terrible terrible game yeah like the gameplay is one thing the story was horrible the character models were horrible the voice acting was horrible there's nothing redeeming about the game period it's amazing how bad it was yeah i'd be surprised if the trailers they've rolled they actually showed gameplay like official gameplay or is it still like an alpha 
No, there was a developer preview where uh, a Japanese developer and then like an American developer were kind of just showing you parts of the game with gameplay. Yeah, okay. Well, it only lasted yes. like three or four minutes. It was very short, but it did show you right. enough. Uh, the main thing that I got out of it was that this is just the RE3 game imposed on the RE2 engine that they made to remake RE2. For sure. It's Definitely. the exact same engine. Absolutely. You, you can tell, even if they don't tell you, you can just tell by looking at it. It's the exact exact same but i don't think that's really a bad thing necessarily because i thought that re2 remake engine was tight i liked it a lot yeah and i mean they've done this this is their second time doing this now because they did the exact same thing when the gamecube came out that's when zero that's when resident evil zero came out they Mm -hmm. redid one two and three no they never did three did they they only did one and two i don't did i don't think they redid two i think they just redid one didn't they is really they only did one and zero yeah, I think Resident Evil 1 got a remake on the GameCube, but I don't think RE2 did. I think that this RE2 remake that came out a few years ago was the first RE2 remake, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Well, that means once they do a... Tr- well, technically, if they're counting the remake of Resident Evil 1 on the GameCube, that means with doing three, that's tying up all the original Resident Evils as having remakes, at least for a while. Yeah. RE3 is a weird one for me. That's kind of cool if you think about it. With 3, they're ushering in, they're successfully ushering in an old IP in all of its original form in a new format. Yeah, the, unfortunately, the RE1 remake kind of doesn't fit because the RE1 remake is old, for one thing. It's, it started on the GameCube, I think, and then they re-released it on PS4, but it's just the GameCube remake with some you know, icing on top. But it's not like it's not like the RE2 remake, not at all. The RE1 remake is much inferior and it doesn't really have the same vibe. Whereas I think with RE2 and RE3, you're going to feel like you're just playing two uh, expansions of the same game. Right. Well, I mean, the reason why RE2 is successful is because they took Shinji Mikami's approach. That's what they did. (laughs) They saw what made RE4 great. They didn't apply it like they did with re5 or six for that matter and Mm -hmm. just try to make action games and i liked six slightly but five definitely not but anyways what i'm trying to say is is that's why two is super successful is because it's re4 but re2 (laughs) it's that's that's all it is (laughs) yeah very true and so it's kind of interesting so re2 and re3 were the exact same when they were originally released re3 was sort of just re2 with a slightly different approach to the way they designed the game it's the same engine but they made the levels a little different they made the combat a little bit more actiony but other than that it, it felt like you're basically playing two games two expansions of the same game now you have that same thing happening again with the remakes but this time both games are the re4 engine basically dressed up which is really a good decision because let's face it there are no re fans out there that are not going to say four is the best and if they do say that four isn't the best i question them i question their honesty i don't believe them (laughs) oh it's it's hard to really say that because everyone at this point if all the re's have kind of are not survival horror i guess is what i'm trying to say <laughs> one still is and the some original people one the remake of one is still traditional survival <clears throat> horror that's what i meant when i said it doesn't really match the two and the three remake yeah well yeah and you were saying how any, anyone that didn't say re4 was the best one or slang to themselves <laughs> <laughs> i truly but, believe that yeah i it's hard though because nowadays the with younger people there was a high chance that they got in with like RE5 or RE6 Ooh. and it's like Ugh. they don't give a flying fuck about like real survival horror and they're unfortunately going to slowly become the larger base of you know as we get older and well, it's just like it's just kind of how it happens and I mean that's the whole point of them kind of ushering in this old saga of Resident Evil in a better format is because right. they're like you know it's like all this content that they can bring over and kind of like bring into that RE4 20, you know modern version but that a lot more people like yeah well i mean they should because as much as i love the original trilogy they were so clunky and i remember trying to get friends to play those games and no one wanted to play them 
people would just kind of like roll their eyes at the games because of how clunky they were. The movement, the tank movement system, I still have nightmares about trying to fight zombies while fucking turning, flank, flanking my wrong side, turning the wrong way because the fucking controls are so incredibly unintuitive. Yeah, it's funny at now in hindsight, you're, it's, it's amazing that they actually were a successful IP. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I loved RE2. Uh, other than 4, if I had to name my second favorite after four it's definitely two still just because i like the story the most and i felt like the the level design was the best as well and i like leon he's my favorite protagonist in the uh the whole deal so it's it's just uh i find it interesting that they're going with this re4 archetype and not the re6 archetype and it started with the re7 kind of reboot when they turned it into more of like a horror game again they i think it's quite simple (laughs) They chose to go backwards instead of frontwards. So it makes me wonder just how popular RE6 actually was. Oh, it flopped. I'm pretty sure it was the sales were pretty bad. Yeah, I was checked out because I, I, when RE5 came out and I played it for about 30 minutes, I turned it off, never played it again, and I thought I was never going to play another Resident Evil again, honestly. I was pretty surprised when RE7 came out, and from what I saw, I was just like, whoa, this is this is like an Evil Dead game, essentially. And I played it, and I was not disappointed. It really was... Honestly, it's one of the most refreshing reboots of all time. Usually reboots are kind of cringy, but this one was just like, ooh, that moment where the the crazy bitch comes out of nowhere and starts trying to cut your arm off. It's just like there's these things in this game where it makes your skin crawl and you're when that ogre inbred ogre guy is like trying to find you in the house and you're hiding from him there's just these moments where you're just like oh shit this is new this is something i haven't felt in a long time oh for sure not only is resident evil 7 technically is what that game's called Mm -hmm. what is my favorite resident evil of all time period Mm -hmm. like i think that game should have set the stand like when i saw that game or after i beat it i was like this is where resident evil needs to go they need to change course they need to fucking embrace this because that was some of the most heart pounding fucking action at least for the first part of the game it kind of teetered off after a while because all the scale scares kind of you know became old but it that first initial half an hour to an hour of gameplay was a fucking roller coaster and not only of, of horror in video games but in general like i've never been so tense in a video game other than those first 10 minutes in resident evil 7 it was crazy (laughs) yeah yeah and i would actually say it was more like the first two hours of the game the first i think that the part where the well it's not about where the chick tries to cut your arm off i think that happens right about at an hour or maybe 45 minutes to an hour. And then I think where it starts to taper off is when you escape underground and you find all the shit underground. And then after that, the scares start to become a little bit, uh, a little less intense. That beginning part though, you don't expect it. I think that's a part of the reason why it was so good is you're going into this with the memory of RE5 and RE6 being like, all right, here we go again. And you get in there and it is anything but that. I really regret not playing it on virtual reality. That is my biggest regret with that game. Because I had VR, and I didn't get it for VR. I got it for a different platform. Big mistake. Should have done the VR. Damn. Yeah, and other than Resident Evil 7, Resident Evil 3 is my favorite of the trilogy, the original trilogy, because that was the first one I played. Mm -hmm. And then I I backtracked, and I even after the fact, I was like, Resident Evil 3 was a lot more fleshed out. Not only did it have the smoothest version of the the movement system and the firing system of the three but it also just had a more versatile item menu too like not i'm not talking about extensively Mm -hmm. it just it was just just a little bit better in in a normal way as you would expect from a trilogy game for sure the ui was way more polished i think is what you're trying to say like the menus especially like i remember especially in the original resident evil not the remade one the original the menu system was one of the most god-awful things i've ever experienced in my life and they improved it a little bit in two but three like you said three is where it really you're like okay i'm not embarrassed to show my friends this anymore yeah right around dino crisis came out <laughs> dino, yes. i remember getting the dino <laughs> crisis demo with my copy of resident evil 3 <laughs> yeah. i was like dude what's this and then i was like no (laughs) never again yeah what's this 2020 leaks of dino crisis (laughs) (laughs) that would be pretty cool if a demo of a new dino crisis came with the re3 remake no daniel oh man you don't know it's real you do you (laughs) it is happening 
Uh, with this Resident Evil 3 remake, do you think they're going to change the story at all? Do you think they're going to add new characters? Because yeah. from what I've seen in the trailer, which obviously isn't very extensive, as you've noted, it looks almost the same. I haven't seen any new characters yet, and I don't think I've seen any new areas or plot points or anything. What do you think with that? Do you think they're just going to expand the story kind of like, you know, with the kind of a soft touch? Or do you think they're going to go hard in the paint and actually add like new characters that change like the dynamic of the storyline? Oh, no, they're definitely not going to do that. All the key, the, the trailer showed all the key players, mm-hmm. like almost literally almost everyone besides Wesker himself. I, I just don't think they would do that. I think they are going to flesh out some other scenes they didn't really have the opportunity to do like they did in Resident Evil 2, like with, uh, what's his name, the cop at the beginning that gets mm-hmm. a bit, you know, like his, his scenes are way, you know, not only better looking, but more dialogue. It's just more well played. It feels emotional, you know, like they're going to do that with all the scenes, obviously. And in that way, they're going to they're going to, you know, tweak the storyline a little bit because obviously they have to make some more more bullshit up, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah. Well, speaking of that, what do you think about the original setup with meaningful choices and multiple endings? Because that was a kind of one of the features of RE3, if you think about it, is it had a sort of uh, choose your own adventure aspect to it. I think there were three endings, right? three or four. I know it wasn't much more than that, but the main thing I remember, because I only beat it twice and I got two different endings, I remember, and it all revolved around the helicopter at the end. There was one where Nikolai steals it from you and leaves you for dead. And then there's (laughs) one where you take it from him and you leave him for dead. Do you think that they're going to either keep the exact same choices and the exact same multiple endings? Do you think they're going to remove that part of the game and just have one ending with no choices? Or do you think they're going to expand it? It'd be cool if they expanded it because obviously, you know, to bring up Resident Evil 7 again, that was an actual all new entry into the actual franchise. And it implicated Chris Redfield in his younger days, spoiler alert, (laughs) in a certain way that I won't get into, but that happens. And it may, it, if they could tie that in, if, if they do it like that, essentially, if they, they connect it towards onto the last canon piece of storyline they've developed in a cool way, then do it. But other than that, I think they should probably stick with all the endings that they have, all the bonus endings. And that's, and that's all, you know, hopeful stuff. I just hope they have all the original endings. And if, yeah. and if they have that, then I'm good. <laughs> Anything more, I would just hope it's done well. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I if I had to choose, I'd say the least likely is adding more. I, I think they're either going to keep the same or they're just going to nix it and just have no choices in one ending. My fear with this game is they're going to dumb it down. And if you remove the choices, you're dumbing it down. If you decrease the difficulty, you're dumbing it down. There's all these little vectors in which they could dumb the game down. And I just hope it doesn't come off dull because of that. Because there was a sharpness to RE3 when you first played it back in the day. It was difficult. It had all these new features that really felt fresh. And the big thing was Nemesis himself. Nemesis was like the main character of RE3 as far as I was concerned. He provided almost all of the actual terror moments where he, you know, his little things where he'd show up and it always was this tense moment. Do you think that uh, Nemesis is the greatest RE villain of all time? Where do you put Nemesis on your list? Him and Tyrant, to be honest, other than Wesker himself, I think, uh, you know, actually, Salazar was pretty funny. (laughs) He was a punk asshole of a motherfucker, but Salazar was kind of a a cool villain, you know, especially in the first part of RE4, just like the the village and it being in Spain and just like it was it it all very his villain. Mm -hmm. It was just nice. It was was cool. It wasn't the best for sure. It's hard to compare him to those other three I mentioned. So I saw that and give him a mention. (laughs) You actually consider Wesker a villain because I always kind of go back and forth on that. I feel oh, like he's, he's totally a villain. I feel like <laughs> yeah. he he's like an archetype of a villain, like he's the Magus type villain, but no you, way. <laughs> he's you don't fucking think so? a villain. <laughs> yeah, uh, dude. <laughs> I don't know. There's just different there's different versions of Wesker. Some games he's he's a straight up villain and then there's others where you kind of see more gray area with him. Well, there's an evolution of Wesker. Let's put it this way. Maybe you would've been right around I don't know, Resident Evil 2 or 3, maybe in between. But after the events of 3, I would pretty much confirm him as a villain, and then even more in 4 than 5 
and then six. Yeah. <laughs> you where know, is clearly a well. Bummer. I didn't play six, so that might be why I have this opinion. That maybe- actually, I don't, honestly, I don't think he's in six. I can't remember six. It was so shitty. There was yeah. I remember a fucking like giant machine mutant thing that had a claw arm that was running after you. There was three storylines. They made you zombies. No, there was four storylines. They let you play as Ada after you completed the other three storylines, which killed me on the inside because Ada was the only one I really wanted to play. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I didn't play six at all, and I only played the first half hour of five. So that's my dead zone on the Resident Evil lore. I don't know anything really that happens in those two games. I do think Nemesis is my favorite villain in the in the franchise, just because at the time there weren't very many games that had a villain like Nemesis. Most of the games back then were pretty straightforward with the way they presented villains, and Nemesis was just this, like, mindless Frankenstein monster that was only hunting you because you were the last star or whatever. It's like, it was just this really cool thing. Stars! Yeah, yeah. Like, I I have a recurring, you call it nightmare or dream. I don't really consider it a nightmare because I never, like, wake up scared from it or be like, oh, God, or anything like that. But I have this recurring dream where there's something chasing me, like something like a Nemesis. I'm not even sure if it came from playing that game or not i don't think so but the fact that i have dreams like that kind of speaks to the way that game touched me with the way nemesis was portrayed where it just felt like he was the specter you couldn't escape like no matter what you did he was waiting to come for you kind of maybe even like the grim reaper a little bit too Unless you stocked up on rocket launchers all the way to the fucking end and you just <laughs> blasted his ass right when he tried popping out on you and then dead before the end of the game and it goes to cutscenes because you gangster. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Nemesis. I've been waiting my whole fucking life for this moment. <laughs> it's funny, before I started looking at the trailers for this remake and everything, I, I almost forgot about RE3. It was really weird. I was like, oh yeah, RE3. And I was saying, I was like, man, I barely remember that game. And then and I started to watch the trailer and saw all these characters and everything. And I'm just like, oh shit, I remember this. I remember that. And it all came flooding back. And RE3 was sort of this unsung chapter of the franchise i feel like that isn't really well known when you ask a lot of people what their favorite resident evil is it's never three it's always either two or four or whatever it's never three yeah it's because two had some of the more iconic moments you know with like the helicopter exploding into the building and and you know leon just being a fan favorite they Mm -hmm. also uh introduced ada you know in that one there's just there's some cool stuff in RE2 to have, but three is the one where they really tried to pull off an expansive storyline. Yeah. You know? It was a good storyline, too. I look back on it pretty well. It was fondly. excellent, for sure. I thought Nikolai was the shit. I was just like, <laughs> my boy Nikolai, all right. <laughs> a duplicitous bastard. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I liked all the supporting characters in RE3. There, it was really it was a tight, high and tight storyline, but very good. They didn't try and get too hokey with it. It wasn't like, uh, say, a game like Death Stranding, where there's like 50 characters and you have to read through a mailbox to understand what's going on. <laughs> it's just like I know, skipped all that bullshit. <laughs> but, <laughs> After like the 20th letter, I was like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> speaking speaking of uh nopes do you think they're gonna add a new mercenaries mode because if you recall re3 was the first game to have the mercenaries side game in it oh dude i didn't yeah. even think about that yeah you had to beat the game to get it and they uh, should because this is going to be one of the coolest casts they have to do it with it's interesting because when i was researching the re3 remake i was actually really looking for that information i was trying to see if they said anywhere we're going to have an updated mercenaries mode and they have not said a damn word about mercenaries so and then they also have come out and said we're adding a brand new multiplayer mode called uh, i think it's called resistance or something like that where it's going to be a multiplayer where one person plays as nemesis and then four humans try and get together to beat him Ah, uh, yes. So That's the, <laughs> the fact that they're adding that, they're talking that up, and they haven't said a word about mercenaries is making me feel like mercenaries is just cut. I was hoping at first that they'd add more to mercenaries, but now I fear that they're not even going to have it at all. Well, I mean, mercenaries, well, honestly, all the games they've put in our mercenaries has been and haven't done that well. I mean, mm-hmm. six and five and what was a... Uh, didn't they come out? I'm, I might be making things up, but I swear they came out with this weird Resident Evil in between 6 and well, uh, the remake of 2. 
it was just like this weird like umbrella like you played as an umbrella team or something like that there was code veronica there was resident evil no Zero. This, is, this is way at this is after all it was like on ps3 or 4 hmm. i forget I don't think this is what you're talking about, but there was a re-release of RE4 that later added Mercenaries. Yeah, well, no, Mercenaries was part of the original, but no, it was the one where, you remember Wait, Tank? they expanded, okay, never mind, I'm thinking, they expanded Mercenaries on the, uh, yeah. the re-release. It was there in the original, but they, I think they added, like, double the amount of Mercenaries in the re-release, something like that. Yeah, because remember, Tank was one of the characters in RE4's Mercenaries. Remember Tank, the, mm-hmm. the Umbrella yeah, that's the game I'm talking about. You play as him. It's an origin story for him. You play on the Umbrella SWAT team or whatever he's a part of. I feel like I've played that game. I remember yeah, what you're talking it, about, but I don't remember the game itself. It it wasn't that well received. But anyways, all those games, they all, I think, had iterations of Mercenary. And none of it did well. So I, I wouldn't blame them if they're canceling Mercenaries. <laughs> mm, yeah, it sure seems like that. Do you think, they're, do you think that they're going to change the battle system a little bit to differentiate it from the re2 remake because if you remember re2 and re3 felt they had a very different feel with the way the action went went out like re2 still had the sort of holdover from re1 where it was still slow and tanky a little bit improved in certain ways but it still had sort of a clunky feel and then re3 came out and you felt like it was an action game you know what it reminded me of uh tomb raider when uh re3 came out i was like oh they kind of uh tomb raidered up the the way the game works with the action do you think yeah. they're gonna kind of do something like that with re3 remake to differentiate it from re2 remake because so far it looks like it's the exact same and that kind of worries me because i think that's going to take away sort of the special flavor that re3 had in the first place yeah well I, first of all i don't think there's going to be a need to because of what they're going to do essentially just they're using the re2 engine so i mean it's just because of the way the physics work and the way they they're making the game it's, it's not going to be a problem it's just a, a problem of the past right well they don't have to change the engine but what i hope that they're going to do is kind of do things to make it more action-based in its own merit like say reduce gun loading time uh make guns stronger make make her faster you know like little things like that you can do to sort of pump up the action without actually changing the engine in any way maybe i mean i could just see them doing that in like a base value way like they learned from you know the the comments from re2 but i don't think they would do it in a drastic noticeable way just because it's re3 because it, it would have to be something like worth its weight you know like they couldn't just speed a character up that would just you know kill the the overall playtime of the game. They would never want to do that just for the sake of speeding the game up there. So it would have to be something fun. And I just can't imagine anything that isn't inside the realm of the original game that they mm. could do, really. Because that's really what, in my eyes, what they're doing is they're just kind of taking this opportunity to bring RE3 up to where RE2 is at now. Yeah. And that's it. I don't think they're trying to... You, you know reinvent the wheel as you would say with re3 in any, in any way i think they're just like get it up to snuff make it look good give them all the iconic moments maybe a couple bonus things and i and that's obviously why i don't think you're hearing about mercenaries because was mercenaries really part of the original resident evil 3 yeah, that was the very first game that had it you had to beat it to do it though like it, it didn't show it to you till you beat the game fully hmm but it was yeah. it wasn't very good though. The original Mercenaries was kind of a piece of shit. I didn't like it at the time. But uh and you know, I mean just I guess my final thoughts on this remake. I'm getting kind of sick of remakes. There's too many of them now and it feels like it's just becoming a giant cash grab at this point and there's no actual want or soul behind it. I'm hoping that isn't true with this one. It seemed like with RE2 there was like a real heart behind the remake and that makes me hopeful for this one too. But it is starting to get a little worrisome with all these remakes and it's like what what's going to happen when you're done remaking all these games are we just going to go for another generation of remakes 10 years from now uh, i guess it's just kind of a meta problem i have with just this whole concept of re3 remake in general but i am you know still tepidly excited for it i'm gonna buy it i'm gonna play it but uh, i don't know i'm just i'm just kind of getting burnt out a little bit on remakes but i will say this if they do the clock tower right <laughs> that could be really fucking cool the, the new graphics with new 2020 graphics so i guess we'll find oh, out they're definitely doing that there's no doubt about it i don't know why they would miss such a grand opportunity yeah 
Well, it wasn't in the budget. Yeah, shit like that does happen, unfortunately. <laughs> and you're like, wait a second, this is we needed all the VFX budget for this. It's like, well, uh, it doesn't happen very often with games from big studios like this, but. So we had like we had river money to Dino Crisis. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any well, uh, closing thoughts before we uh, yes close out? Actually, I do. Two Spirited Penguin. <laughs> I'd like to end it with this excerpt from Wikipedia Dino Crisis fan page. <laughs> for several, <clears throat> excuse me, for several years, fans have been asking for a new installment of the Dino Crisis series. In 2014, rumors began circulating that Capcom had begun development of Dino Crisis 4. On March 30th, 2014, Phil Spencer himself was questioned about whether or not rumors that Dino Crisis 4 would be released on Xbox One were true, to which he responded, dum dum dum, we aren't working on DC. It would have to be another publisher if it were true. <laughs> no! <laughs> and with that we will end our preview of resident evil 3 remake <laughs> stay woke my millennials and we're back with our review of hidao kojima's epic movie death stranding as with all of our reviews here at the Crack Cellar, there are lots and lots of spoilers coming at you, so if you haven't seen this movie yet, you should probably pause right now, go watch it, and come back to us later. That being said, Broadcaster Nichols, what do you think about the native ads in this game? <laughs> what did you think <laughs> the first time you realized that your canteen was not full of water, it was full of monster energy drink? Listen, Daniel, it's it's a strong market move. I mean, I, I can't disagree with the man. <laughs> if I could get a monster endorsement, I would get a monster endorsement. If they want me to wear a t-shirt, fucking I'll do it. All right? <laughs> I would. And I will. Monster, you're listening. <laughs> and also, don't forget to watch Ride with Norman Reedus Wednesdays on Which AMC. <laughs> Is that for real, though? Dude. I heard that was a made-up show. <laughs> okay, no, the show's real. I can't believe people watch it, but it's real, and it's like on its fifth fucking season or some shit. And yeah, whenever you take a... It's either you take a shower or you take a shit. I forget which, but one of the two. Anytime you do it, just an ad appears on your fucking shower slash shitter <laughs> for the yeah, fucking ride with Reedus. And it's just like, you know, I understand what happened there. Norman Reedus is like, hey, buddy, can you please plug my show and your game that I am the main character of? And Kojima said yes. But man, it's hard. It's hard when a game is supposed to be high art because with Death Stranding, this game is supposed <laughs> to be high art. That's what he was going for. The game Gameplay was obviously a secondary thought when he made this game. So for when you're going for that, for you to taint it with A, monster energy drinks, and B, ride with Norman Reedus, it just leaves a weird taste in your mouth. Well, just Daniel, doesn't... I know you're not a marketing guy, but let me give you a little bit of a taste of what it probably went down like. It was more like Norman walks into Lord Kojima's office and says, Hey, I noticed you got monster energy drinks in this uh, game. I got this really uh, shitty show that has taking views. And I was wondering if I get a little bit of uh, that Lord Kojima sauce. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and he's just like, then all of a sudden, the next day, what's this? Twitter post by Lord Kojima. Me and Norman Reedus in broken English are soul warriors. Don't No one knows what the fuck that means from. I'm pretty sure some shit went on in that office. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <All right. laughs> That's yeah. marketing 101, Daniel. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's a weird one. There, there were always weird little quirky things with Kojima games. And this and Death Stranding is no different. But there definitely seemed to be an undercurrent of sellout that went through this game in certain ways. And what we just talked about is really the main things I'm thinking of. But tell me... What did you think about the plot holes in this game? Because with Kojima, you expect A-tier writing at the very least, if not S-tier. That's just kind of what you expect from him because everything he's done supports that. And the number one plot hole that I just cannot consolidate in my mind is the fact that Timefall, the rain in this game that they call Timefall, affects human skin. It affects packages, but it doesn't affect clothes? What the fuck? Well... 
I think it affects clothes. It doesn't no, affect. It, doesn't. it no. doesn't affect the textiles that they they made, like their delivery suits and stuff like that. Okay, are made then, of like time fall proof material. Okay, then why aren't the cargo packages made of that? It's a good question. Now okay. there's a plot hole there. <laughs> <laughs> All that, right. Well, that's what I'm saying, and it also seems like the rules for dead bodies don't quite seem to make sense either, because it was told to you early in this game that when people die. They cause void outs and they become BTs. They but can. It, it doesn't. It doesn't always happen though. Yeah. I killed so many mules with lethal ammunition in this game. Oh really? All all the fucking time. These guys are like, "Don't do it." D- you know, die hard man. He's like, "Hey, hey Sam, I know you're thinking about popping some caps in those mule asses, but use a Nerf gun, goddammit. it!" And you know, I was just. I got to a point where I was at a certain point where I needed to kill these mules, and I didn't have anything but lethals. And I'm just like, "Fuck it, I'm just gonna see what happens." And I fucking took down this mule camp. I left, and nothing ever happened. They never t- created a, uh, a void out. I went back later. There was no void out. They just kind of respawned. There were no BT ghosts around the camp. It was just like, okay. I'd really like some consistency if you're trying to make an art piece here, Kojima. You're not making Call of Duty, so I'm not going to expect Call of Duty things from you, but I do expect you to keep your coherent storyline going because that's what you're supposed to do. And it just feels like he forgot about some things. Almost like he made these rules up early, and then later on he's kind of like, ah, fuck it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he's just like, right at the end, he's like, you know what, fuck it, give him Metal Gear Solid, give him the goddamn guns. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, when you get to the end of the game and they start throwing quadruple rocket launchers at you, I'm just like... <laughs> Instantly brought me back to Metal Gear Solid 2 when I got the Nikita missile launcher. I was like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, taking a step back, I really like the atmosphere of this game. And there seems to be like some very vague 2001 A Space Odyssey vibes that you get from it sometimes. And then... There is a heavy Lovecraft influence on this game. And if you, if you don't know Lovecraft, basically Cthulhu, that is what you know from Lovecraft. Everyone knows Cthulhu. Even people have no idea who HP Lovecraft is. All of the bosses in this game were clearly inspired by HP Lovecraft. And to the point, where, to the point where the boss, uh, at, uh, Edge Not City, the first time I thought I was about to beat the game and didn't know there was six hours left to go, that, that giant colossal BT with Higgs and Emil stuck inside. That was <laughs> yeah. the most HP Lovecraft boss I've ever seen in any game period, including Bloodborne, which is also heavily inspired by Lovecraft. It was yeah. incredible. I played every Kojima game that's ever been made. I think you probably have too, or very close to it. I've never seen him ever really reference Lovecraft or really go for that vibe ever, really. Have you? Do you remember anything? No, this is the first time he's really... And he went hard in the paint on it, which I found really interesting. Well, he had to go hard on the paint to cover up the model of Solid Snake. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He tried really hard to squeeze in what he could. (laughs) Yeah, and this game does not have a lot of music in it. Uh, For the most part, when you're playing the game, it's just ambient noises and not very many of those either a lot of the time it's almost just dead silent other than you know uh norman reed is huffing and puffing when you're not pressing l2 and r2 yeah. fast enough. they have like suspense music and like mm-hmm. pursuit music and stuff like right. that but. the few the few music uh pieces in this game that are actual video game music i really loved like when you encounter the mules and it does like that 80s blade runner techno yeah, music for sure I, oh yeah. i loved that and that's then a great a, sound the, then there's another theme from when you fight the bt quote unquote bosses so, so let me take a, a step back here there are no bosses in this game till like the fucking end of the game to like chapter 10 you think that there's a boss early it's a big bt that looks like something out of Bloodborne that you fight relatively early. I think like around hour two or three. You're like, oh, I'm at the first boss. Cool. Uh, that's not a boss. Y- you find out real quick that that's just a standard BT that you're going to fight anytime you get caught in the future. It's just a standard uh, BT boss that you can run away from at any time. You never even have to fight them after the very first time you kill one. You get caught. They run you to the giant tar pit. The buildings start coming from the ground. There's a giant Bloodborne boss and you just say, Peace and run away and it's over. 
that game escal- escalates fast, dude. Super fast. All of a sudden, you run into four of those things at once, and you're just like, how the hell do I... Oh, wait a minute. I just got to get the hell out of here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. just no way. Exactly. And one of my biggest problems with this game is I feel like the game didn't even begin until I thought it was at the end. My big problem with the music in this game was the low roar band that I guess is <laughs> Kojima's favorite band, and he took their entire catalog of music and stuck it in this game. The music is a red herring. As soon as you hear the music, you know there are no BTs in the area, there is no danger, and you're basically just taking a happy stroll till you get to your destination. Once that music starts playing, you have passed all of the content of what you're doing, and you're just in the home stretch about to get to wherever you're going. It always signifies safety. It kind of ruins it a little bit, because I want to think there are still BTs that could fuck me up. I don't want to just be like, okay, I'm in Candyland now. Yeah, I never really thought about it that way, but you do. You definitely have a point. Yeah. I wasn't a fan of the music in general. Like At the beginning, I thought there was a couple good songs, but then after I got to hear the whole catalog it just it just didn't really fit no. and it seemed it just seemed especially with considering the actual two tracks or the few tracks of actual gameplay music they have they didn't match at all there's probably two or three tracks out of of the actual music they leased for the game that i thought fit kind of i was like you know this is all right this is appropriate it was it was sad to see such a poor performance on the on the ost considering where Metal Gear Solid 5 left. Oh, I know. <laughs> it, it's like a barren wasteland on that OST. It's not good. Yeah, definitely is a not the greatest part of the game overall, I'd say. No, it definitely wasn't. Not even close. <laughs> and it's hard to even call this a game. I jokingly introduced this as Death Stranding the movie. I don't think it's really a joke, <laughs> Broadcasting Nichols. I, I honestly believe it. I When I played this game, in retrospect... It felt like you were playing a movie till the last three or four hours, essentially till you get to Edge Not City. You get to Edge Not City and shit starts to happen and the gameplay starts to ramp up. And this is when it truly becomes Metal Gear Solid. It, like when you're fighting these bosses at the end and you're shooting quad rocket launchers at them and shit, you're just like, oh, I did this in MGS5 at the end too when I fought that super mech or whatever. It's It was really interesting how this game started off as apocalyptic UPS Postman the movie and slowly became, oh, uh, guys, this is actually a video game. We need to actually have gameplay. Uh, Oh, I know, you made Metal Gear Solids. Let's just put some Metal Gear Solid in here. Man, they missed a huge opportunity missing Kevin Costner. <laughs> I was I was waiting for a Kevin Costner reference, cameo, something. I was oh. like, dude, this is Postman the game. You have to get fucking dude. You have to get Kevin Costner. What's going on? That but, is a great insight. <laughs> I totally forgot right. about that movie, but you're right. It's almost now that you say that, I almost feel like that movie might be Kojima's basis for this shit. Well see. You know, I may have uh, seen a video called Metal Gear Solid Zero once or twice on the internet. Uh, <laughs> not saying I agree or disagree, but when I, you know, I, I heard his point, it, it, it hit my soul. Because I, was, I asked myself, how can Kojima just walk away from essentially what he's been doing his whole video game history? He's never really done anything else. How is his next game? outside of that franchise gonna just not have a damn reference not not give you some type of clue you know some meta message to be found mm-hmm. and i think death stranding definitely has it this postman beginning where you're just this person trying to connect people by delivering parcel and packages you know it's just and all of a sudden you then find yourself wielding weaponry to deliver these packages and you're so, you slowly realize this is no gear solid <laughs> and went to fucking delivering packages mm-hmm. <laughs> you know and then you and you get to other parts that we'll get into but you know when i saw mad mads mickelson's character smoke that cigarette for the first time in command of soldiers i instantly thought of solid snake and i don't know why I can't tell you why exactly, because they don't look anything alike. The only thing you can say is is that there's a cigarette in his hand, mm-hmm. and they're they're both wearing fatigues. They both have military costumes. Those are the only two things, but their characters don't have any other relation or common any commonality at all. So I don't know why I instantly thought of Solid Snake, but I did. And I just know, deep down, that was Kojima 
he wanted he wanted people to see that that was intended <laughs> no i agree um i have a conspiracy theory about this so there was a game that kojima was going to work on right before he got fired called silent hills and this is notable because silent hills was a collaboration between the character dead man in death stranding gilmer del toro and the main character of death stranding norman reedus so that game falls apart because he gets fired uh he can no longer make metal gears so silent hills taken away from him metal gear taken away from him what i think happened with this game is that he had like this overarching sense of a movie he wanted to make that sort of rang back to like the 40s and 50s of that old school style like cosmic horror HP Lovecraft weirdness, but he also wanted to make his last Metal Gear story, and he also wanted to do his Silent Hill story. I think he combined all three. The Cliff storyline is Metal Gear Solid Zero. I feel like the BT storyline is Silent Hills. The Norman Reedus, like basic storyline of the game, I think they stole a whole lot from Silent Hills. I think that the BTs themselves were designed for Silent Hills, and they took them. I think that they really? did the assets in anticipation of making Silent Hills. He got fired, and he's like, fuck that. I'm taking these with me. EA <laughs> wouldn't, they didn't know exactly what he'd done yet. Like, there's no, he could have easily taken anything he was working on at the time with him, and they wouldn't have known. So I firmly believe that. I firmly believe that there are elements of Metal Gear Solid Zero of Silent Hills, and that's why the game feels so disjointed. And why it seems like the combat was an afterthought and the gameplay itself didn't even really feel like it started till you're 15 hours into the game. Well, you know, I am a Kojima, a Kojima fan as much as anybody else listening to this podcast. And if you're not, get the hell out of here. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> he has his flaws. And I think his biggest flaw is his ego, especially when it, it's launching his new IP. You know, and there's, you have to, you have to, you know, Konami is a terrible company. I'm not trying to defend Konami, but you have to kind of look at what happened. Konami was tired of the huge amount of investment and the very little in profitable return. That's kind of how his games were rolling. They're very hit, huge and acclaimed and have giant fan bases that helped Konami out in image. But as far as like profit value compared to like their gambling sector and other things going on, like cheaper mobile based games, they were just like, dude, this is crazy. We're tired of giving you these millions of fucking dollars to make a triple A game and barely seeing anything in return. It's just not going to happen next year. And that caused a lot of rife with Ko Kojima. And then he got demoted and this guy he didn't really like at the company got his place in return, which caused even more internal rife because, you know, Japan's all about that honor shit. Mm -hmm. And that just like started a cascade effect, which ended with Kojima leaving the company. And I, I'm definitely on Kojima's side because that's his style and that's what they hired him to do. And that's what they shouldn't be mad at why he, his style and how he was doing things but that's here nor there nonetheless you have to imagine that that's still Kojima. you know he took that into his own company and here he is getting kicked out of the company he's been with this whole time and he has a lot of pressure on himself you know like a lot of people are just like oh what's he gonna do it has to be a fucking fucking just a smash hit out of the park you know he's kojima he couldn't fuck up that's a lot of fucking pressure <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and it has to be brand new and he just got, he just like sank him, himself creatively in Metal Gear Solid 5 and Silent Hills, you know? So it's just like, it just, I only can imagine where he's just like, oh, that'd be a cool idea, but I get sued for that. So, you know, that probably came across and, his head so many fucking times. So yeah. he probably panicked. Yeah, you know, right. like that's probably why I feel so cobbled together. It's just like, oh, it's going to be a delivery game. And they're like, fuck, this isn't fun enough, dude. People aren't going to like this game. Oh, we got to add some Metal Gear Solid elements in because people love Metal Gear Solid. You know, I, I felt that. Yeah. Well, the thing with Cliff is that he was an integral part of this game from the very beginning. I started seeing Mads Mikkelsen's like screen cap uh, moments that uh, Kojima would put on Twitter right when this game started development. So he was not a late tack on. They weren't like, oh, no. we have to add a B story so we can add Metal Gear Combat. Dude, he was, this was yeah. by design. And he was in the you, first trailer. Yes, and if you really think about all of the Cliff missions, so like the Supercell, so how many were there? One, two, three, were there four? There's three. three. Three of them. If you really look at those missions... How can you look at those and not think that that was a future Metal Gear title until he got fired? <laughs> think about it, dude. The time travel, going to different battlefields with a character you're fighting who's just like Snake, who says shit that Solid Snake would say or Big Boss would say. It just strikes me as a middle finger to Konami. I feel like he knew that if he added this Cliff stuff the way he did, that Konami would not be able to sue, but they would know 
that that was oh, yeah, something sure. he was going to do with them, and he took it, and he made it anyway without it. And what, and what a great actor to fucking have a spiritual send-off to a fucking awesome character and franchise. Hell yeah. <laughs> I love Matt. Because that guy, yeah, dude, what a fucking amazing actor. Every time, in that battlefield, dude, when he would be just, when he would just whisper, like, BB, where are you, BB? Dude, that fucking, it just mesmerized me, dude. It was such great performance on his part. Yeah, the acting. I would say the acting in this game is some of the best acting that has ever been in a video game, period, ever. You can have whatever criticism of Death Stranding you want, but when you look at the totality of the main characters, they all had amazing performances. And it, it starts with Norman Reedus. Norman Reedus, I think, is a better voice actor than he is a real actor. Fight me. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> Walking Dead fanboys. He sucks in Walking Dead. He's cringy in Walking Dead. And he is amazing in Death Stranding. I couldn't, like, I couldn't help but just think, dude, I've never respected Norman Reedus's acting chops until I played this game. Yeah, well, this is just my opinion. I got nothing against Norman Reedus, but <laughs> Neither he do just, I, man. Uh, Listen, he, I love uh, <laughs> the Doondog Saints, all right? I love that movie. He just never seems to actually really be acting. He kind of seems to be his own kind of awkward character self, and people notice that that would be a good television slash movie character yeah. in wherever they can fit him. You know, kind of like Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson and shit. They just kind of like, they all, I mean, Norman Reedus obviously has like a different palette of movies under his belt, but they're still the same archetype. Like they're just, they're who they are and you just fit them. You design something around them. It's kind of like an R&D concept. Do you design it around the power source or do you design a power source for what you're building? Mm, that's <laughs> a good way to put it. So uh, <clears throat> this game is so weird in certain ways. The game was designed to be tense and horrifying on paper, right? Like you're playing this game and you're you're like in this purgatory apocalyptic land where there are ghosts, evil black ghosts just waiting to murder you at every fucking corner and it's just so dark and then you you play the game and in practice, it is one of the most relaxing games I've ever played in my life. I would just chill and play that game and just be on my motorcycle, ride with Norman Reedus shout out and uh, going over a mountain pass and then the, the low roar would come on with one of their little melancholy tunes and i'd just be like i feel like i could fall asleep right now this is not what i think i'm supposed to be feeling yeah it was a bad choice with the music but we've already <laughs> you know what you speaking of vehicles though while we're on gameplay still vehicles felt like 50 50 to me sometimes they weren't consistent like i go over some of the same areas now just glide i'd be like all right here we go and then other times it, and this mainly happened with the motorcycles not so much the 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 trucks i would just clip on these rocks and it would just be this cascading effect where if it was on a hill or something like that and i tried to back up it would not engage the gas anymore like i would have to double tap on the reverse and then hit the gas and by that time i'd be rolling down the hill just all kinds of fucking problems with that it just seemed frustrating <laughs> it was you could tell that he cut corners with the vehicle movement system which is really ironic because the actual on foot movement system while you'll hear a lot of people deride the the actual base gameplay of this game a lot of people call it a walking simulator which i honestly i think that's a fair assessment for the first half of the game you could really Definitely, just call it a walking for simulator. sure at however, least the first area and a half yeah but however if you think about it this game has the deepest movement mechanics in video game history you can alter the way a character moves with like 10 different buttons in varying degrees then they cut corners with the fucking vehicle system where it feels like something off of guess one crazy taxi or something i think what they were i think it was planned i think what they were trying to do is kind of make the vehicles wonky on purpose so they had flaws he'd be like well i don't really want to take the vehicle even though i could just jam that fucking vehicle all the way up to the fucking crest of that snow on the mountain just to fucking you know get past a bunch of shit i don't really want to do it because i'm probably just going to fucking spin it out and roll down the hill three times before i get pissed and just leave it in the middle of nowhere you know yeah i mean they definitely designed it to not be convenient and not be good in certain areas and hell they they straight up take vehicles away from you once you get to the uh, mountains right at a certain point they just send you off 
on a cascade of like 13 quests and there are no vehicles available unless you just have one from earlier. And if you lose that, yeah. good luck. Well, you can also rely on, I mean, I don't know how the game works as far as servers and getting connected to people and how many people you're actually connected to. But my the, the server I was on, or the instance, if you will, was just there's v- littered vehicles everywhere. Even like the, I never the part I'm talking about where you're like yeah, in the mountains yeah. delivering the bomb yeah. and stuff like that. Yep. Yeah. And wow. even the game mentions it, you know, because the game's just like from here on out, you're not going to have an opportunity to, you know, make a lot of stuff. You're going to have to rely on some of your fellow porters. And I was just like, well, good thing. Fucking my porters are a bunch of litterers because they <laughs> leave their shit everywhere. Well, there were no vehicles anywhere. And I was playing online. Uh, there were no vehicles anywhere. I'd go to safe houses. There would never be any vehicles in the garage if for like, really? a good three hours of the game. So maybe I was just on a weird server and this is totally unique to my experience experience but it felt like they took away vehicles from you for a large part of the end of that game or like the middle end i would say and i thought that was kind of weird because it's like hey the vehicles are already kind of questionable in this environment anyway why take them away just you know use them at your own risk i I didn't really quite get that (laughs) yeah man I, i it's hard to get into the head of you know kojima and why he would do certain things Did you notice that on the motorcycle when you hit the turbo that reality starts to glitch out Oh yeah, the like it, it does, looks almost like it's raining. It does, no, it does like it does pseudo matrix effects. Like the like reality tears apart like on little lines going through the sides of your monitor, or your television. It looks like a glitch that would be a real glitch maybe 15 or 20 years ago, but they did it on purpose as a, like a design, like an aesthetic. And I was wondering if you think that that was supposed to have a deeper meaning because I whenever I saw that I'm just like is this supposed to like signify that this world isn't real and that like this is just a simulation or some shit like that well honestly my when i first started playing the game uh, what i thought where the story was going was completely different where it actually went i thought like at one point i was like this is like a suicide game isn't it norman reed has killed himself a long time ago and like this is some weird fucking purgatory like life after death type shit isn't it (laughs) that's where i really thought it was going but anyways the like system in that fucking game i when i first saw it i was like okay this is going to be some crazy, heady, meta-level fucking shit from Kojima, right? Like, he's going to, like, just flip it around on you at the very end and just lambast our social tendencies as a hum- as humans nowadays and stuff like that. No, he didn't do anything. In fact, it just ended up being this really gay aspect of the game. And not only that, the only redeeming, I should say the only redeeming part of it was Heartman. Heartman was the only person that I thought used it sarcastic enough Mm -hmm. to make it funny you know like every other character did it like sincerely and i was just like god that is so gay (laughs) (laughs) it just like wasn't cool but then Hartman just he had the timing down like he knew exactly when to put a fucking thumbs up (laughs) no I, i agree with you i think that the social media integration in this game if you want to call it that, uh, however you want to term it, it was creepy in a lot of ways. I didn't like it for the most part. I do agree that the Heartman stuff was enough tongue in cheek to where it kind of diffused the creepiness and just made it kind of funny. But if you really look at some of this stuff, it it doesn't even really add much to the game. In fact, I think it no. detracts from the game. There I was moments, really waiting for it. <laughs> yeah, there, there were moments in this game where I got to spots that I knew were supposed to be this hard trial of a delivery run but some dude built a bridge that surpassed everything that you were supposed to encounter and it just made it a fucking two second drop and stop you know what i mean there were some seriously easy parts of this game that i do not think were designed to be easy but they just were because i happened to play the game a little bit later than some guys that were super fans that built bridges across the entire fucking game yep and it it happened a lot like as the game got older and older older Mm -hmm. i noticed that pretty much all the areas i went to all had expedite tricks like all of them had tethers or bridges set up to the point where i didn't even need a vehicle i could just fly past an area and it definitely scales up towards the end i actually liked it um so once you you know once you get to edge not city and all that stuff happens you get sent back you know the upside down castle part that's obligatory in every game now you go backtrack all the way across from the country that you just traversed i liked the integration of all these buildings all these uh, structures on the trip back i thought it fit because on the trip back it should kind of just be glossed over because you already did it once i liked it i thought it was really cool i found zip lines and spots that weren't there before i'd like travel through the mountains on zip lines and just it felt it felt better on the return trip but on the trip there it felt cheap 
And of course, I could have chosen to ignore these and play offline, but I also felt like this game was designed from its very conception around this asynchronous multiplayer. And I felt that if I didn't have it turned on, I wasn't playing the same game that everyone else was. So I kept it on. Yeah, dude. I mean, I, and I'm right there with you, but I, the reason why I was keeping it on is I, I thought there was going to be like this Kojima moment, like this river of sorrow type shit. You know, it's like, how many likes did you fucking do? How many things did you use? But versus the likes you gave and like you had to, there was just this like monster that like scaled in difficulty or something. I was, I was thinking about it in my head. I'm like, he has to be doing something with these likes. So I was just jamming on likes. Anytime I found a fucking, that something that was legitimately well-placed, you know, if I was just in the middle of nowhere on the snow-capped mountains and someone put a generator out there for my legs, I, I just smashed that like button. I was like, <laughs> 500 likes, here you go, bud. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and I was hoping like that would amount to something. But it didn't amount to it shit. Did. It was a waste of time. I What you just said would have been so much cooler than what it actually ended up being. And when you beat the game finally, and when I say beat the game, I mean after you've seen the credits three times and after you've done like the four hours of post credits cutscenes, you finally get to the end where it ends mission 14, which spoiler alert isn't actually the last mission. It gives <laughs> you the end of game results and it gives you the total amount of likes and all this shit it gives you how many times bb liked you all this bullshit and i'm yep. like hey i thought kojima, that's why when it was about to happen hey kojima you did all this shit how about you actually make it mean something other than a fucking spreadsheet at the end of the game that no one cares about they're gonna skip through with r1 yeah was he was like, even uh, he was even perceptive of it he added a quick fucking skip like mm-hmm. that's how much yeah that's how it was definitely a, a glaring omission in the game it just it was such a good opportunity to have one of those heady kojima moments at the end you were just like kind of asking to c- cool it down you know you're just like all right kojima this was way way too around the bend for most people like we need to bring it back to reality a little bit yeah and then there's other factors of the game like the likes where you're just like what <laughs> I was just smashing likes to feel good. (laughs) Thanks, Kojima. (laughs) Yeah, it it was like you said, it was a huge missed opportunity. It was something that could have been so cool and it could have changed video games. And he just was like, well, I'm going to do the first 25% of the work and not have anything that actually uses it. And maybe it's for future games and he's going to take it and expand it, make it better in future games. But this is its own game. I didn't pay for future games. I paid for Death Stranding. I paid for this concept and I feel like it was only delivered to me in a quarter or a third at most. For sure. I was I was definitely felt wanting at the end. I felt like Mad Mickelson's character was not re- it was resolved at the end. Right. But it just didn't feel right. I'm just like, if really, that was it. You guys could have gotten to that so long ago. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you didn't need this huge played out. Let's start from the end and go backwards storyline to fucking tell that tale. It just it, it didn't it didn't need to happen. And, no. and for the other part of it. Death Stranding as a whole, as its story goes, felt like it was Kojima's idea for a franchise, for another Metal Gear Solid. It it felt like he was trying to fit the whole fucking idea in one game instead of having a Death Stranding 1, 2, and 3. I don't feel like that's ever going to happen, but I feel like it could have happened. Mad Mickelson's storyline, Norman Reedus' storyline, Dead Man's storyline. Fucking how cool of it would have been to see dead man and heart man storylines fleshed out because they were some of the coolest parts of the storyline and you just briefly find out you know they're just like oh yeah by the way this is uh you know me yeah <laughs> cool all right cool <laughs> <laughs> now we're moving on back to rock layers and how it relates to dinosaurs i, I know you didn't <laughs> think the game was going there but it is all right <laughs> so <laughs> yeah i really liked all the characters usually in most video games nowadays i only like one or two characters and most of them i could just throw out the window but i did all of them were not knockouts i liked them all except for die hard man which i found suspiciously like vague and like and then of course they deal with that in the end as you know and i thought that was a brilliant way to do die hard man that you didn't you didn't even know anything about him till the very end of the game then you're like oh fuck and his name was so justified too Mm -hmm. it was it was such a he had a really cool storyline he was an unsung, uh, unsung part of the storyline, for sure. 
Yeah, and I really liked Cliff's storyline, but there's one thing about it that just never made sense to me, and maybe this is a plot hole, or maybe this is, it is what it is type of thing, but I thought that his skull soldiers were going to be an integral part of his storyline, that we would get some explanation on his skull soldiers, and you get to the end, and it resolves his storyline, and you don't even really know why he became this Supercell BT thing. He got murdered, you got, you got murdered... <laughs> And he, you get repatriated as a baby, and then you become Norman Reedus as a, a human, right? It does not explain why Mad Mickelson just becomes this, like, pseudo-BT monster that haunts tornadoes that fly around America. And it does not tell you why the fuck he has these four skull soldiers tethered to him at all. There's just no explanation for it. They, well, they briefly explain it. They say pretty much his hatred for Bridget and Die Hardman pretty much kept him from leaving existence, you know, passing on to the other side. And that's why he passes on when he hugs you in the, at the last time you see him, when he tells you that you bring people together and he tears people apart. It wasn't good at all. But honestly, on the school soldiers part, I think it was just another reference to, to Melgar solid. Mm -hmm. It was just symbolic in a way. Like Mad's character was the metal, Gear solid franchise. And BB or Norman Reedus was Kojima and Mel Gear Solid died and Kojima died with it, but was reborn, you know, and now he's on a new beach making new games. You know, it's wow. like, it's yeah. like, it's just really weird. Like I saw it all. Like I was just like, I was like, I see the symbology. That's, that's a very insightful <laughs> note because I, now that you say it like that, I 100% agree with you, but I never thought that while I was playing it. You know, I really liked Cliff. I liked his storyline. I liked almost everything about that whole thing with him, but I just felt like they totally glossed over how he became what he, that is. And it's like, okay, yeah. he was so sad that his kid died. It made him hatred and he became a BT ghost and ran into tornadoes throughout America so he could find the <laughs> stuff. Okay, I'll accept that. But you have at least got to tell me why he has four fucking super soldiers with him that he directs with his cigarette you can't just leave that that's like one of the most glaring things it's like dude it was integral to the game and you literally just gloss over it and even the explanation for how he becomes this bt creature like you said they give you one but it's like okay dude then why isn't there a shitload of those how many people lost a son in this apocalypse? I'm guessing a lot so he's the only one that was so upset everyone else hates their children okay kojima yeah, when you're that close, when you're making that complex of a storyline, you're super close. You know, you're looking at all the fine moving parts, making sure everything's smooth and everything's moving right. And then <laughs> one fucking Joe comes by and looks at the broad picture, and it's like that doesn't fucking make any sense at all. And they're like, "Drats." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, I'm not trying to like talk too much shit about the storyline because I actually thought the storyline was the best part of this game. And for sure, for me, <laughs> if the storyline was mediocre. I would be talking about a much different final score for this game than I'm going to give because, oh boy, there's some real problems with the gameplay that we've already gone over. And one thing I want to say before we totally abandon gameplay and just go into the, the story and the ending and shit, what did you think about the bomb missions? The ones where you're transporting, I think it happened three times in the game, where you're transporting a bomb and if you fall over, it just vaporizes you into out of existence and it's a game over screen. <laughs> What did you think about those missions? Well, I hated them when I was trying to use vehicles because I was a huge advocate of the truck and because it protected the cargo from the rain. So I use it all the time and I, that's how I did most of my missions. And then after realizing that it's way easier to carry the bombs on foot, I enjoyed the missions. I never fell over when I was on foot with the bombs. So I never explained really? when you're, yeah, but I hated it when it was in the truck. I just didn't know. You'd literally have to go one mile per hour and not tilt the truck or the motorcycle at all, or it would, or it would go off. It was yeah. just like stupid. Yeah. I used, I actually used the floating carriers for the bombs. That was my oh, strategy. Oh, I didn't think of that. Because those didn't take vibration damage at all. No, unless you do something really crazy, they never move. And it's 100% yeah. durability by the end. Some but there were a few times where I wasn't using the floating carriers and I was just holding it on my back. Dude, towards the end, like especially the final bomb mission in the mountains, you would get all the way to the end of this thing. And then at the last second, you just hit this little bullshit rock that's barely poking above the snow that you didn't even see that makes you trip just a little bit and then boom, game over. It was one of the most frustrating things I've ever experienced in a Kojima game. You had 
like the all train legs and holding you know, both your shoulders. You know what I think happened is that uh, my skeleton ran out of battery power in this specific case, and that I was running on just normal legs, no no enhanced body suits. Damn. Yeah, but again, this part of the game. There were there were no vehicles available to me anymore. I, I looked everywhere in every safe house I could find, every place that would have a garage. Every garage was empty. Uh, all I could it was do a blessing was, in disguise. All right, you yeah. fucking hated it. <laughs> all, all I could do was you know travel on foot, which is fine. But there weren't very many generators, so there I had to be really careful with generators. And even if I was, there would be points where I just run out of juice and I just have to get the the rest away on my foot. I just felt like the bombs were a little too unforgiving. I get it. It's a bomb. But if you just like rustle a little bit, why is it triggering? Like how bad of a bomb design is this? Yeah, especially when you compare it to the uh, all the other types of cargo. Mm-hmm. It, like all the other types of cargo were super generous, super generous. And then came the bomb and it was just a fucking sp- you breathe on it wrong. And it just was going off. It was stupid. Yeah. It just if I was to describe the gameplay in Death Stranding in a nutshell, it would be fun but limited, you know? Even even when it got towards the very end when you got to have gunplay and there was some more thrilling moments in the storyline where they brought in the gold blobs that would drop and stuff like. There was just more uh actual gameplay to indulge all the way from start to finish. It just every aspect of it seemed fun at first. Its initial burst was exciting. And then it became super obvious that that was it and it was going to be shoehorned into what you see and there was nothing else. There was you you knew that nothing was ever going to progress. Like when I saw the mules for the first time, I was just like, oh, okay, this is cool. I'm going to start start running into these mules. And then when I ran into the terror, it was funny. It was that conversation with you off the mic, well, off the crack seller mic, I should say, (laughs) that it kind of enlightened me about the whole thing when I was just like, yeah, you I don't shoot the terrorists. I just ran by and you're like, terrorists? What terrorists? And I was like, you know, the terrorists that shoot at you. And you were just like, I just thought those were mules. And I was like, no, they call them terrorists in the game. And then you're like, oh yeah, I just thought they were mules. And then when I played the game, sure shit, the map still calls the little orange outline on in the game mules. Mm -hmm. But when they shoot at you, they're considered terrorists. And it's just like, that was it. Like that was the, that was their evolution. That was going to be it. And that just kind of like, it's just the whole game. That's every single element of the gameplay with this game is that you get something super original yet shallow mm-hmm. and you move on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> I probably use this cliche a little too often, but uh, the game is definitely a mile wide and an inch deep. And yeah. it, you see it with the mules. You see it with the the safe room. The, in the beginning, you're like, oh, this is cool. So this is going to expand over time. And, you know, it's going to become different. It's going to become like a command center. And you have all these ideas. But then by the end of the game, you're like, well, wait, nothing happened except for, like, I have some figurines on my mantle now of the enemies I fought. That's the only thing yeah. that ever changes. And you're just like, does anything in this game really ever change other than just the storyline? Because the storyline does a lot of changing. But nothing else really does. <laughs> Listen, there's enough change in the storyline. We got you covered. The <laughs> suit was one of the bigger disappointments. Like, I, you got the orange suit when you were doing the cremation in the beginning. And then you saw security forces with, like, a darker suit that had, like, uh, they just kind of looked different. And I was like, oh, you're going to get all three of these suits eventually because you're so good at doing porter services. Certain missions are going to call for certain suits that give you certain benefits. There was none of that. And they even showcased the suit. In the fucking ro- the private room. I was like, okay, they're showing you the suit because you're going to be able to switch suits, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, that was a disappointment. One thing that I did find pretty funny, the only food in this game is floating tardigrades. <laughs> and when I say that, I mean it literally. There, I was looking for other food in this game. Like, are they ever going to introduce some other type of food? Are we ever going to see a character eating something yeah, else? The monster only- energy drinks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the only thing you consume in this game is tardigrades and monster energy drinks. What? And porter ale. <laughs> How metal is that, though, that the only food source are fucking tardigrades? And they make it a point to be like, you hungry? Yeah. And take a tardigrade and they just crunch it in their mouth with, like, ecstasy. <laughs> like, you're just like, dude, this, it this was is weird. <laughs> it's weird, but it's it's strangely metal. Like, I just have, like, this feeling like this is something that a uh, ministry would do or uh, <laughs> deicide, maybe, you know? So it, it felt kind of metal, but also very fucking weird. And again, it goes to signify how shallow this game is. 
There's only one of everything for the most part. You think that it's going to become two or three or four eventually, but it almost always just stays one. Yeah, the exception to that rule is is the dog with the golden face and the whales. They're like, here's one dog. Here's four dogs. <laughs> Boom. Evolution. Here's a whale. <laughs> here's a lot of whales. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> So getting to Edge Not City, this was almost purely a walking simulator. Towards the end, it did get a little gun heavy, a little bit, not much, but more so, especially in the Supercell missions that we've already talked about with Cliff. But you get to Edge Not City, and according to the game itself, according to Die Hard Man, according to everything that you think, this game's about to be over. The ending is supposed to be you getting to Edge Not City, finishing the network, getting everyone in the UCA, and saving Emil, who's in Edge Not City. So essentially, Edge Not City is Bowser's castle and you're there. Shit starts to get different and you're like, oh, what's going on here? First of all, the way you get there is so unorthodox. You have to get caught by a BT and have them drag you out into the ocean and then run away from the BTs into Edge Not City through this tar pit ocean thing, whatever they're going to call it. So dope. (laughs) <laughs> it was it was really fucking cool, and it was out of nowhere, and I liked how they didn't really tell you what to do until you were running around like an idiot for a while. It, at first, they're kind of like, well, just read a mail, figure it out, dummy. But if you just keep running in circles for a while, eventually Die Hard Man's like, uh, uh hey, hey, Norman Reedus, um, so remember how you can get caught by BTs and they drag you places? Uh, you know, that, that might be helpful here. Click. <laughs> just like, uh, oh, okay. So Kojima has a mercy rule. <laughs> <laughs> I was just I just got caught by accident I was just fucking around and I, I wasn't even like at my wits end yet I was just mm-hmm. got caught by a BT <laughs> mm-hmm. like, alright well Yeah, the problem for me is that at that point of the game, I had gotten very good at killing BTs, so I was actually going around the field just murdering BTs. Like, I was cutting their umbilical cords, I was shooting hermetic grenade launchers at them, like, I was just decimating the BTs. By the time he radioed this shit to me, saying, hey, you know, this is what you do, I was like, oh, fuck, I killed all the BTs, and I had to restart my game so that I could get dragged by a BT. But every time... Stormy came in the room watching me play the game. He's like, what are those? And I was like, those are the shadow people. Those are what Norman Reedus fears in his dreams. So I cut them out for him. (laughs) And I just started slicing away. (laughs) What a cool fucking spot that was. And I think from this point on, it's almost a different game. As soon as you get bowled into the ocean and you you make this trek to Edge Knot City, from here on, everything's kind of different. And it it starts as soon as you get to Edge Knot City and you get prepared for another delivery mission to supposedly the final one. You have you have this one mission hey go put edge not city on the uca and you're thinking okay this is the last mission and as soon as you start to move from that first outpost you start at all of a sudden the metroid brain bugs come out you've never seen these fucking things the entire game and all of a sudden this entire city is full of them and nothing else and i thought that was a great move it was so ominous so all of a sudden you're just like what the fuck you have no idea how they work how what they do how they operate if they kill you or not hell they could be good guys for all you fucking know it was just a really cool way to to differentiate that last level and that further proved to me that this was the last level i took those brain bugs as like oh this is the last level he's signifying it with this new enemy you get through and uh oh boy you get to the first actual boss fight of the game isn't that crazy if you don't count the cliff missions, and I don't, I don't think those are boss fights. I think those are more like Metal Gear Solid skirmishes. But if you don't count those as boss fights and you don't count the bullshit mini boss fights from the BTs earlier, which I also don't, this is legitimately the first boss fight of the game. And I also thought it was the last. I legitimately thought the first boss fight was the last boss fight and it was going to be a symbolism thing. Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. I thought it was going to be some shit like that. And this boss, didn't it look like a final boss when you were playing uh, yeah. it? Yeah. A hundred percent scream. This is the final boss and all the shit with Higgs and Emil. It, it's choreographed. This is the final boss. Uh, spoiler alert, kids at home. There was at least six more hours after this point of the game, maybe longer. <laughs> I'm not sure anymore. It was, it was insane though. <laughs> But the one thing I found really cool about the second half of this game is that it really made Higgs way cooler. I thought Higgs sucked for most of the game. I didn't like him as a villain. I didn't understand why they were pushing him as the villain. 
I just didn't like him. What this, uh, I can't even call it the second half of the game, what you can call this final act of the game, I think it really cemented Higgs as one of the better Kojima villains. And I think part of it is that voice act. Whoever voice acted Higgs is a fucking badass, and I want him to voice act everything. Yeah, Matt Mercer, he's definitely, he's a, he's a solid voice actor for sure. Yeah, man. So do you have any thoughts on like that spot? What was going through your head when you were fighting that colossal BT that, was basically Emil. At that point, you're kind of convinced that Emil was that giant monster, even though it ends up being later that Emil controls that monster and controls everything and is basically a god. Yeah, I don't know. The, it seemed like a final boss, but I also felt at the same time that it was like the first phase of the boss or something like that. I didn't think that was going to be it, but then it was it. Like going back to the evolution of things in the game. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yeah, that was it. <laughs> Here's some chiral. <laughs> game. Move on. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's really unfortunate. I like the storyline. I like the end of this game, but I don't understand why every game has to do the backtrack thing now. Is it just like we don't have the budget to make more levels? What is it exactly? Because it seems like every game I, I think play that's now, exactly what it was for him, at least. Yeah. I think he just had such a huge storyline. He couldn't fit it in the budget he had. Mm -hmm. So he found a creative way to do it. Yeah, and there are all kinds of uh, MacGuffins to explain it away, like, oh, you know, conveniently fragile can't port anymore, and oh, you gotta come to fragile, she can't come to you, no more fast travel now that you would need it the most, and there's just all kinds of little things in the plot where it's like, dude, this is a contrivance, you made this up just to explain something that you wanted to do that doesn't make sense in the storyline, and that really yeah. bothered me. Yeah, it wasn't... It it's hard because all you can do is compare it to Metal Gear Solid. And that took so, uh, so many years. There's listen, multiple decades involved with fucking conjuring that up. <laughs> I compare this game to Zone of the Enders and Zone of the Enders only. Man, let's just say Zone of the Enders wasn't known for its compelling storyline. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you take that back. So what did you think about the difficulty? Because you played it on the hardest difficulty, right? Like I did. Yeah, and it was irrelevant. It was, it was just, easy. Yeah, I, I when you told me about it, the difficulty you chose, it reminded me that you could pick a difficulty. I was like, oh yeah, fuck. Yeah, no, it, I don't understand if the difficulty only affected combat or if there were some hidden modifiers that maybe made cargo easier to break or whatnot. But the game felt insanely easy 99% of the time. And then there were a few parts where you get these little artificial difficulty spikes. And usually they were uh, the Supercell missions. I don't know about you, but that first one, uh, I got wrecked a couple of times. Uh, the second one, I got wrecked a couple of times. The final one, though, I beat... I one shot i didn't die once on the final one probably because i was just so used to it at that point but uh yeah the difficulty really for the most part and this is why i'm bringing it up is because we're talking about the end and like the actual bosses of the game the bosses were all super fucking easy on the hardest difficulty even if yeah. you do die you just repatriate in the middle of the boss fight with the boss at the same hp yep. percentage i'm just yep. like wow this how can you have a difficulty called the hardest difficulty and make it this easy i thought that was a disgrace i, th I think it was just how slow paced it was they they were aware they were self-conscious of how slow paced and kind of boring the game was they didn't want people to feel even more put off by like dying at a critical moment like a boss battle and having to redo like that huge walk or whatever they had to do to get there you know well i don't i, I agree with you on the walk part if they did that i'd be pissed but you could just start the boss fight over again and, you know, I get it. The whole like repatriating the, thing, period, was weird. It was. and I very rarely had to do it. And when I did do it, I was just like, oh, yeah, this yeah. happens. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I only died once in the entire game that I didn't, like, reset from. I think I died a couple times, but when I did, I just reset the game back. Uh, one time I didn't in the very beginning of the game, like in the first area, and it, it created a, a void out from yeah. my death. And I forgot about it. And then on the trip back, at the very end, when I'm getting close to capital not city i'm like oh shit that's my void out from my only fucking death in this game oh yeah the crater yeah and i'm just like oh that's that's kind of funny i totally forgot that that was even a thing because like i said you can kill mules to your heart content they're not voiding out it's just like apparently only you cause void outs even though the lore doesn't say that it says everyone does it's, i don't know the void out thing is a weird one for me but i feel like this game's too easy on hard mode 
Yeah, I, just, I don't think there should have been a difficulty level, to be honest. He should have just made a base difficulty level with how he treated it. Yeah, I agree, but he wanted to make a movie. That's that's why this difficulty was so low. And they even, think about this, there were like four difficulties lower than the one I picked. How? How did you make it easier, Kojima? Did you make them, do you remove all the mechanics and just make people use the joystick to move and that's it? Like, what? I don't even <laughs> understand, like, the game journo difficulty at the very bottom. Like, how neutered was that? I, I, I'll never know because I'll never play play it like that but it's just it's weird to me that there were four difficulties below mine and i thought mine was easy it just goes to show you what people consider easy in this life and why you see so, so many people screaming for handouts so oh, wait a minute we're not a political channel <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so once you finally complete your trek across the country you get to capital not city and you come to the second boss fight of the game which is the giant space whale Broadcaster Nichols, what did you think to yourself when you saw the giant space whale appear to you? Well, I personally, I paused the game and I rolled a joint. <laughs> and, and then I list, I put on Flying Whales by Gojira. <laughs> and I fucking smoked that son of a bitch. Because <laughs> that was probably one of the coolest moments in gaming history. When I saw that fucking whale come at me and open its mouth like fucking the worm from Dune, I was just like, this is too fucking cool. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that fight was sick as hell, but again, super easy. And it yeah. really pissed me off how easy it was because I thought that that boss fight was one of the coolest boss fights Kojima's ever done. And he's done a lot of cool boss fights. It wasn't aggressive enough. It just sat there and flo- it, it floated around. That's all it did. It just mm-hmm. waited to die. I, when I saw the buildings popping up, I was like, oh, these are safe havens for a little bit. Nah, dude, you can pretty much camp on those the mm-hmm. whole game and just fucking smoke his ass. Well, they do go away, but they go away very slowly. And I only had to change twice. Well, like, that was it. And I think <laughs> they don't start going away till you have his health at, like, 25%, and then they start going away. Because the one thing that kind of saved the difficulty a little bit is that last 25%, the buildings start moving down, and you have to be in the tar more, and then, like, the, the BT ghosts, you know, people that pull you down into the hell or whatever. Those guys started to pop up all the time, and you had to basically Oh, the gold ones? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was cool. I like that. But I thought, hey, the whole boss fight should have been like that. I don't know. I guess I'm kind of salty about the difficulty in general. They were afraid to make that game challenging. They were because at the heart, it was a movie. It's sad. Truly. That too, like they could have done more with everything. Like the fact that there was only like eight different things you could build. Yeah. I was like, what? That was surprised me the most. I was like, what? Where are like the the rope systems and, and like dope ass, like expansive ladder systems you can make that scale mountains and shit like i was really expecting to see some ingenuity (laughs) yeah no it it ended up kind of being like a zelda in in reality and again we're going i'm going to briefly go back to the stupid creepy social media integration it cheapened things you didn't have to do anything everything was done for you already but going but going back to the good part of this game the end uh so so you beat that land the the space whale and it's fucking such a sick boss fight that underwhelms because of difficulty you get done and you're like oh i'm at capital not city where everything began and you kind of get like this full circle kind of feeling in this melancholy but it just had like this weird kind of feel like i'm here this is it like you know you're about to die or something and you get here and you have a a meeting with all the main characters in the same room and that was one of my favorite cutscenes of the entire game just to see them all not as holograms as real in the same spot with sam having a conversation like a jrpg and one thing i found really interesting and i'm wondering Wondering what you think about this. Did you notice how Sam fucking okay? So Mama, clearly the hottest chick in this game. She she's a smoke show. Mama goes and tries to give him a big hug when he shows up, and he pushes that hoe out of the way like he he's either gay as fuck or the most loyal straight guy on the planet. Like I could not believe the way he reacted to Mama. What do you think about that? Because they never explain it, as far as I know, why he treated Mama like that. Yeah, that was that was a glaring uh, thing I saw. It it, it was really weird. Uh, Dead man touched him, and he's like, "Oh, you got over it. Look at you." (laughs) It's just like, "Well, wait a minute." Mm-hmm. I, you know, touching on that subject, it got real fucking weird with Norman Reedus and Guillermo del Toro. <laughs> there were some moments in this game where I, I was like, this it. is, this is, uh, <laughs> you're not picking up this energy <laughs> that I'm picking up because <laughs> there was some weird vibes in that game, you know, with BB, even, even at the yeah, BB, the shower. The oh, end God, the where <laughs> I forgot about the, the, the end of oh. the end of the game where he kind of just like uh, softly <laughs> for a second. <laughs> it's, very, 
<laughs> it's all very uh, all very weird, fast and loose. Yeah. Uh, on the other side of that token, I'm going to say that Dead Man was my favorite uh, main character, recurring character of the game. I really like the way that Gilmar Del Toro acted him, portrayed him. It was really believable. And he's not really an actor. He's a director. So no, he did. He did very well. Yeah, I thought was I thought he was amazing. And I thought that like their shared connection with BB sort of made him like the second main character of the game. In a weird, he slowly way. became one in a way. In what's yeah. weird is when when I first heard of this game, they they described Guillermo del Toro's uh, influence or his presence in this game as limited. He was a special guest star. He was yeah, they he, even he was in it more than anyone else. Yeah, they label him as such too in the credits. Yeah, <laughs> I found that really odd. Yeah, so 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 we're in this meeting and. <laughs> It's like, okay, fragile, you're not in any shape to do this. You need to rest and eat more tardigrades. You know, she's like, fuck that. I'm teleporting Sam. And she teleports Sam to Emile's beach and you fight Higgs, the the actual Higgs. This encounter is the third boss fight of the game. And oh my fucking God, was this a Metal Gear Solid boss fight? It was, Holy dude. Holy shit. I, when I was playing this, I was like, Konami might sue. This is the part dude. where Konami might sue. Are you talking about all the artifacts on the ground? All the artifacts. Like the- the, play, on the, the PlayStation ground. Media Player, the CD Player, like the, all these Metal Gear Solid things. <laughs> dude, just just the design of the boss fight felt like it could have been out of Metal Gear Solid 3. Uh, the dialogue, the way that he talked. And this is another thing that I really liked about Higgs is his dialogue was so pompous, villain. Like, think of M. Bison from the Street Fighter movie. That's how I looked yeah. at Higgs, dude. You know, and he broke the fourth wall all the time. And I really like that, too. He'd be in this boss fight, he's like, just a good old fashioned boss fight. We got doom, Sam. <laughs> and later, like, I'm the particle of God. Like just these fucking lines where I'm just like, dude, is, is this, is this a caricature of the character in the game now? Like what happened here? Because he did not act like this for the first 90% of this game. And then all of a sudden he became one of my favorite Kojima villains. <laughs> Yeah, there's also, like, a plot hole with, like, you ever notice, like, in that, right after that, or right before that boss battle, when Amelie is, like, notices you, and it's like, Sam, and then he, like, realizes and, like, makes Amelie, like, snap back into, like, death protocol? That was weird. It almost set it up like he was manipulating her, Mm -hmm. and then it turned out the other way around, and they never really expanded on what exactly Higgs was doing to control Amelie. It was just, like, this plot mechanic that they just kind of glanced by they were just like yeah that happens but really it was the other way around just get with it (laughs) it makes no sense especially after you get further past where we're talking about right now and you really find out the truth about amelie there's no fucking way in hell he could have been controlling her so what the fuck was that yeah it it, it stuck with me to the very end i was just i still don't realize what he what was going on there yeah yeah it's like hicks had ulterior motives or something And he lost and he just decided not to tell everybody what his ulterior motives was and played along with the original design. I want to. All right. So I I just want to keep going with this ending and we'll talk about some details in between. But so so you do this boss fight, Metal Gear Solid boss fight, right? hundred percent. And it's so cool. Visually, you're on the beach and you have Amelie on this giant spider web facing the red sun. It's just one of the coolest things I've ever seen. This game has so many things where I could say that, too, where it's like this is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. This was no different. You finally beat Higgs. And I love the way you beat him. You beat him by grabbing grabbing a PlayStation off the ground and smacking him with it. That was like one of the <laughs> coolest things in the world. I'm so glad that this is one of those things where because Kojima is Kojima, he was allowed to do this. If some upstart developer was like, okay, so for our final boss, we're going to grab a PlayStation off the ground and smack him in the face. And that's how we beat him. They, he would have been laughed out of the goddamn studio, but Kojima was allowed to do that. Shit and it was brilliant. And I'm glad it happened. Dude, all the things were brilliant. And I, I thought that was actually how you had, to hit him and then i realized you could just fucking outflank that bitch and smack have a good old smack down with him oh yeah you could just fist fight him too but that was way slower yeah. and dumb so it, yeah like you could do it but the way to do it was to you know grab shit off the ground and beat his ass with it which i loved and, and so, you, so, so you beat higgs and you think you beat Pit higgs but then he comes back he's not dead yet and you're fighting over amelie and all of a sudden the game turns into punch out and this was one of the craziest <laughs> well, goddamn things in the entire game. In another, a game that defines crazy. This game defines it, crazy, and this is one of the craziest goddamn dude, things in the game. 
Dude, it was another it was another Metal Gear Solid shout out. That's exactly what he did between fucking him and Liquid at the end of Metal Gear Solid Four. It was Solid Snake versus Liquid, and they had a punch out match on top of the submarine, bro. <laughs> that was instantly what I thought. I was like, dude, he's been waiting to redo this. They like they were like, you're not doing it in Metal Gear Solid Five. He's like, we have to do it in Metal Gear Solid Five. They're like, no Metal Gear Solid Five. <laughs> he's like, I'll show you, motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah, it was really awesome. I don't even know if you can lose at it because I I beat it the first first time and it showed that i was almost dead and i i suspect that no matter what you probably don't die on that but again i don't know for sure even had the fighting game interface with the health bar yeah, and that shit. it was awesome <laughs> it's just another thing where this game just really breaks the fourth wall in very minuscule barely detectable ways that you cut your brain kind of just lets go and you don't even think that he's breaking the fourth wall but he really is like changing genres of game but in the game is definitely a fourth wall break breaking thing but I love it, and I'm, I'm glad that he could do it. I think that's one of the best things about this whole deal with him leaving Konami is that he is allowed to do the weirdest shit he can possibly think of, and I think that's a good thing with Kojima. <laughs> yeah, I I hope we see a little... I want him to act... I, I, it sounds stupid, but I really want him to get closer to a Metal Gear Solid game. He needs to get closer to that realm. This whole heady, let's tell a story about life and death and the extinction phenomenon and all this stuff wrapped in one thing. It just, it didn't seem like, it didn't fit for me, and it didn't seem like a good look for him and his brand. When people look back on this game, I don't think a lot of people are going to be like, oh yeah, Death Stranding. Get that yeah. one. I think he needs to meet himself in the middle a little bit. Death Stranding was like his acid trip. I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want. Now he needs to reel it back a little bit. And uh, obviously he can't make a new Metal Gear. He can't make a new Zone of the Enders. But I think he definitely needs to go a little bit, take a left turn back towards those types of games. Just a little bit. Not a lot. You don't have to do a full reverse. Just you know, maybe a little <laughs> bounce. Let's just change the direction of the ship just slightly back the yeah. other way. The only reason I say that is because I know deep down... He still wants to make those games. If I felt like Kojima didn't want to make games like that anymore, I'd be like, do whatever the fuck you want. And best to you. But the fact that he made Death Stranding and it's just Metal Gear Solid with a Postman simulator tied to it. I'm just like, well, you clearly have a hard on for making these types of games. It's never going to change. You you know, it's like you might as well stick with what you know and put some guns in there and a compelling storyline. And you don't have to do, you know, uh, tactical espionage. Even though people would love you if you did, I'm just, it's, but That's a good point. You know, Konami does not own tactical espionage. No, clearly, and there's, Splinter there's a Cell's not around anymore. Exactly, SOCOM's not around anymore. Now Metal Gear Solid's gone. Now, like the the uh, genre is ready for the taking. Going going back to the ending, so so we we beat Higgs and then uh, we free Amelie and we go to Amelie's beach and Amelie's beach is much different because you see Earth from her beach and it looks really fucking cool and you have this cutscene with Amelie where you get a choice you can hang out with Amelie eternally on this beach and watch the Earth burn into flames or you can kill Amelie and save the planet but you have to kill you know your spirit mom or whatever you want to call her this was cool I liked it. Until I realized it was not real. There is no choice here. You can either sit there and watch the world burn with her, but it's a game over. It's it's not a you know it's not an ending. It's just game over screen. And then if yeah. you try and kill her, that doesn't work either. So both choices are a misnomer. The only choice you have is to hug her, which I thought was <laughs> kind of dumb. Yeah, and, uh, I won't lie. I emptied a clip in that bitch's ass before I tried anything. Oh, I was yeah. just like, bow, 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 bow. oh yeah, oh yes, <laughs> yeah. As as soon as the first time I tried, I just emptied the clip, and then I the second time I watched the world burn with her, and I sat there for a second, like, wait a second, what the fuck's going on? And then on accident, while I was just fucking around trying to figure it out, I accidentally hit the right D pad and undid the gun, and the the hug button came up, and I was just like, such a weird fringe thing to do. On one hand, it's so Kojima. But on the other hand, it's just like, how about you really give the choice? Why are you going to give this fake choice that isn't a real choice? Didn't really like that. But you make the choice, you hug her, and uh, that's the end. Basically, that's the first ending of the game. I just did bunny ears because it's not the end, gentlemen. Spoiler alert, there's like three or four more hours left in this goddamn game. And that was after you thought the game was over like three hours ago. <laughs> so, Oh, yeah, dude. It's like, it was so long, dude. I ended up putting a hot pocket in the fucking microwave. And by the time it got to the point where like Norman Reedus was putting a gun to his head and you had to blow your brains out and it was like reconnect, mm-hmm. like 
soon as I pulled the trigger and it said reconnect, the microwave buzzer went off. It was like, ding! And I was just like, oh, there's my reality. Peace out, Kojima. I'm fucking tired of this shit. Yeah. <laughs> I got a hot pocket. Uh, so at this point, <laughs> she you, you get sent back to Sam's beach and the ghost of Amelie, I guess, I don't really know exactly, starts to talk to you. So you just basically, <laughs> this is so weird. You get sent back to Sam's beach and the credits start and you're just like, okay, that's kind of a weird abrupt ending, but whatever. At least it's finally over because I thought it was over five hours ago and I'm starting to get sick of the fake endings and the credits start to roll and you're like, why am I moving around? And you get that weird gut feeling, you know what's happening. You start moving around and eventually you get tired. You fall to the ground and Amelie shows up and just starts explaining to you some of the missing pieces of the storyline. And this happens eight times. You yeah, sit, you it's sit, brutal. You sit in these credits for like 45 minutes. So you're trying to force people to read your credits while giving them little tidbits to keep them interested. But I hated it. I hated that part. That part of my game is my least favorite part. I honestly part. started to fall asleep. Oh, I was dude. I was honestly starting to fall asleep every single time. I was like, fuck. I, I was angry. I don't get angry at video games very often. But it like once the fifth time it happened and it started to make me move again, I'm just like, no, I'm done with this shit. And I, I got really fucking angry. Eventually. Eventually what happens on the final one is she says, oh, I know how you can get back or I'm paraphrasing. I don't remember exactly what she said, but then you have to follow footsteps to some part of the beach and you go to the beach and you see the five floating black lines in the sky that I thought were going to be integral to the storyline of this game. When I first, when we first previewed this no game shit. back in October, I was convinced that those were going to be like the main crux of the storyline and they were the villains or whatever. And I'm like, okay, finally, they're here. And I was like, okay, maybe this credits was not a big waste of time. And all that happens is Amelie says, see, you're still connected and just points yeah. at the sky. Well, you know what they are, right? You know what they're supposed to represent, right? They're supposed to be his friends, his five friends. Because you notice when those five are on the beach and they're like, look, you're still connected. And then you start hearing all their voices. They're like, I found Sam. Sam, he's over here. And then you start hearing their voices one by one and you realize that it's those five. You're like, oh, it's what connects me to the other side or my friends. <laughs> so, so this is, just, is, have you seen this confirmed or is this just a strong theory you have? No, this is my expert anal okay. analytical okay. fucking okay. deduction well, as being I, a fucking God hand level coach. Jima Listen, expert. All right. <laughs> I believe you, and I also hate you for telling me that because I actually liked it more when I didn't know who the fuck they were, and I was angry at Kojima for not explaining and basically not having them in the game. Now that you've told me that, <laughs> I am even more angry at this credit sequence, and <laughs> I don't even know what to say. How the fuck, how, dude? They were in every trailer. Every trailer that came out for this game featured those goddamn black lines in the sky, and it just ends up being his buddies represented in a metaphorical way in the wise words of master shake unbelievable <laughs> okay all right so subsiding my rage a little bit so at this point gilmo del toro pulls you into the water you repatriate and oh boy was the game not over so now we go through a long series of cutscenes that eventually leads to the order to kill bb which was the most brutal fucking delivery you're going to have to make. <laughs> so so after the credits of this, uh, the end credits of this goddamn game, and after all this shit happens, you get a mission 14. I was angry at that too. This is bullshit, Kojima. You're fucking with people and I don't like it. It's not the good kind of fucking with people either. It's the annoying kind. And uh, this part really annoyed me. Why the fuck? Okay, A, why would they order BB to be killed? What logical reason is there? B, why the fuck would Norman Reedus agree to do it and see why is this happening? Like, why do we need to see this? And it ends up being a MacGuffin to show you the end of Cliff's storyline. So, he, <laughs> so you, you walk up this mountain to, and it is really poetic. I will agree that this mission was poetic because it's how you started the game. The first mission was taking some the, was it Bridget Strand, right? Up yeah. to the cremator. And now you're doing it with BB. And I'm going to be honest, I got a little emotional. Not I wasn't like bawling or anything, but like I got a little teary eyed. It's, it's kind of just a weird emotional thing that you're like taking this character that's been at your side the whole game. You're 
taking it to kill it. Oh, yeah, it was it, definitely sad. The was, moment you see it on the screen, go cremate BB, you're just like, what? I just sat through that fucking cutscene in the fucking credits to do this shit? <laughs> the fuck? Yeah, and, and so, okay, so just to go over this a little bit, because I kind of skipped it, this part, I didn't like at all. I didn't like the way Die Hard Man came off as like a whining little girl. I didn't like Norman Reedus's attitude towards him. It's like, bro, you just went through the apocalypse with this guy as your commander, and now you're acting like he's a mean girl at your high school that you're telling off. I just, it didn't have the right vibe to me. Well, knowing what you know now, you got to go to the level of the subconscious level. He didn't know it, but he's looking at the man that killed him, you know? Damn, dude. I, you, you, that's a good <laughs> point. Do you think that's what it was? Do you think that's why Norman Reedus was acting like a bitch is because he subconsciously knew that that dude murdered him? As a baby. Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Man, that's a, see, you do have a mind for Kojima because you keep coming up with these deep cut explanations for shit. I'm just like, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> but, you know, that aside, I was kind of mad because I thought that this was just a post credit scene and that at any moment is the screen was just going to go black and it was going to be, you know, the end. And I was like, dude, you cannot end it with Norman Reedus being a little bitch. Thank God it didn't end like that. And we get to the, the BB stuff. So so we're traveling up to the, the incinerator and it, it's kind of a poetic end. You didn't expect it. You really did not expect that you'd be doing this. And I think that kind of adds to the emotion of it because you thought the game was over. And then all of a sudden they're like, no, you got to kill BB now. And it, you do it, you get there. And as soon as you get to the cremation plant, you go into a series of cutscenes for Cliff and you get the entire explanation for his storyline. All these scenes that you saw uh, when you'd come out of your private room with BB, just little clips from BB's perspective. They string them all together and it makes all kinds of sense. And I really like it. It was super sad. <laughs> super sad and the moment that you realize that Mads is Norman Reedus's dad it, it it hit me a certain way i'm not quite sure why but it was one of the i didn't think the twist was super twisty but it was really impactful for sure well it was a very heady twist it's just because oh, yeah. it there's a and it takes a complex story for that to work out <laughs> you know yeah, so again, they don't explain the Skull Soldiers coming with him into his BT afterlife. They don't really explain why he becomes this BT creature. You do find out exactly who he is, exactly who Sam Porter Bridges is, and all this stuff. And and then you think back and like, oh yeah, that part where he hugs uh, Sam, he says, they called you Sam Porter, but you're really Sam Bridges or whatever. And you're thinking back, you're like, oh God, that was there. And they're kind of telling you this before it even happened. And I really liked the way they wrapped it up, despite the the few plot holes. What do you think? For sure, it was that it was one of those like dangling in front of your face uh, answers to the storyline from the beginning because they like say it blatantly like you're not a porter, you're a bridges. <laughs> and at the very end, that's what's that delivers the very end of this, that wraps up the storyline. <laughs> you know, he's like, I heard you're Sam Porter, but you're really Sam Bridges because you bring people together, <laughs> not like me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And part of it is just the acting of Mads Mikkelsen, dude. Like, his acting, I cannot understate how good of an actor he is in this fucking game. Every scene he is in, he steals it. And that ending sequence was so well acted and so believable. How often do you play a video game in a moment like that where the acting pulls you out and you're no longer feeling it? Because it's like, that was the most wooden line I've ever heard, blah, blah, blah. Not with yeah. this game, dude. Oh <laughs> Happens ninety percent of the time, and, and that's part of the reason why I almost consider this game a movie because it has movie level acting. It it really is a movie. I don't I don't know if he was wanting to do it, but it came off like I'm going to let people play a movie. Like that's really what it was. It was a playable movie. Yep. It, Dude, it was so emotional to see him talk to BB about going to the moon and shit. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, this is another thing that a lot of people, you didn't even seem to fully believe it or realize. I don't know if, what it was, but the fact that Amelie's beach was the moon is that, you know, because they picture the moon in the game a lot. They talk about it a few mm -hmm. times. They even have an astronaut. Kojima's new symbol for Kojima Productions was the Skull Knight himself or the Skull Astronaut himself, putting a flag on the moon. You know, he introduced his whole studio and everything. He even showed a whale, oh, you're right. a hologram whale, that. coming out of the pool. As soon as the astronaut puts the flag down, that hologram whale jumps out on the moon and shit. So, like, it all came full circle. 
And then Mads even talking about it made it just even more how he was just he was promising BB that he he could even go to the moon if he wanted. And at the very end, he ended up on the moon. Mm-hmm. He died and got reborn on the moon. Yeah, that is, you're right. It, it is it's super poetic. The writing in this game was so superb. It's just a shame that you had to get through like 40 hours before you realize it. How yeah. many people? Well, you also have to be willing to peel back that onion. Not a lot of people want to fucking do that bit. shit. Yeah, there, there are a lot of mindless <laughs> gamers out there, but I'm assuming most people that are going to pick up Death Stranding are not mindless gamers because I feel like everything that's known about the game would turn you off if you're just like, I play Call of Duty and Madden. That's what I do. I, I think those people already know that that Kojima game is not for them. But even that being said, I think that he probably lost so many people that were borderline that made it through maybe 10 hours of this game and they're like, fuck it. I cannot deliver another package for no reason. There's nothing going on in this game. And I just think about what they missed out on and it makes me really fucking sad because all Kojima had to do was just throw a couple of bones early on, but he refused to. Yeah, it was sad because the moments you wait for in hindsight were so good. Like I remember the beginning when you were just you just got tired. You were just at that point where you're just like, I'm fucking tired of delivering packages. What the fuck's going on in this game? And you walk out of the the distribution center and you meet Higgs for the first time. Mm -hmm. Like that was dope. When he pull he reaches the ground and grabs the tentacles and shit. You're like, what is going on? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Kojima hasn't lost his touch with excellent character introductions. (laughs) Yeah. I'm the particle of God. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, so is that joint so lit? Where the fuck? <laughs> so so after uh, after Cliff's cutscene, you go into the incinerator. And you go up to it and you you fucking deliver it. And the fact that it forces you to go through the menu to deliver BB to the incinerator is heart wrenching. They force you to do it. There's no option. You're doing this shit. And you do it and a cutscene starts. And he starts hearing Gilmo del Toro in his head saying, oh, you know, well, you could take it off and take let BB out. And who knows what will happen and all this shit. And you're just like, okay, thank God. He's not going to just murder BB. Because for a minute there, I'm like, dude, was this guy just a soulless evil motherfucker the whole time and just doesn't give a fuck about BB but uh you see him start to pull pull BB apart and it ends up that he just puts the cuffs in the incinerator not BB and he takes BB out and BB it looks like BB dies and in in Norman Reedus's arms and this was probably one of the most emotional gaming moments since Aerith's death where you're just watching him like BB no BB no and he's like trying to get him to live and all this shit and you're like oh fuck are you really gonna end the game like this Kojima you fucking ass is this the end can't be killing point? babies bro like, this is not how a game's supposed to end <laughs> but, but uh but miraculously bb you know gains consciousness and is is okay and uh then you see all the bt babies floating there behind him and that was such a sinister moment after such a heart-wrenching moment after such a joyous moment after bb does live and then you see the ghost babies dude i what were the implications of that like did they just mass murder bb's in this incinerator yep wasn't that some yep. dark shit well dude they were the didn't you they were the life source for the knots the whole the whole the whole system all ran on babies BB was the prototype. Like, that was the whole implication. Like, when you find out that BB was going to be the prototype for this thing, and then that whole thing played out, it changes it. But in one of the the missions, you deliver a BB that's not on yet to a, a knot so it can turn on. And that yeah. confirms that these things, like, there was a dark implication about that. And when they were well, of no use, they would just incinerate them. Yeah, yeah. So I got what you're talking about there, but I like it was just weird to me that this one incinerator had all these BBs. It just kind of had like a yeah. you know a Nazi concentration camp gas chamber feel to it. Where I'm just like it For just sure. felt really sinister as it panned the camera back and you saw all these BBs floating there. But yeah, I mean then that's the end. It shows him and BB kind of. Uh, do the like the obligatory all right now we're out here on our own what do we do next and then wait then for the, the presidential the, election <laughs> and, and then the the true credits come and then surprise surprise after the true credits you wake up again in your goddamn private <laughs> room yeah. and chapter 15 begins which is the end game chapter which i have no intention of ever touching how about you it's actually a farce i looked it up there's people that yeah there's people that put in like tons of fucking hours and shit it doesn't do anything there's no like that chapter doesn't like there's no there's no extra bonus completion there's no like little (laughs) i knew that instinctually 
I didn't I didn't look that up, but as soon as it happened, I'm like, oh, this is the end game so that you can explore the world even though you beat the game and see all the wow. cool buildings and all the social media integration and you know, I all personally that thought that we were gonna see the inauguration of Solidus Snake finally <laughs> after the <laughs> anticlimactic ending of Metal Gear Solid Two. Where like when I saw presidential election, I was like, oh shit, here we go, <laughs> it's finally happening. Uh, so so yeah, that's that's the end of the game and holy shit was that quite the movie it was one of my favorite movies of all time uh as a game definitely not my favorite game of all time but can you imagine if kojima just made this a movie it was just a really solid two and a half hour movie and uh, if i was re- reviewing one of the best movies of 2019 it, it might just get an s rank <laughs> right exactly and it's, it's a damn shame man if you look at the user reviews i mean the media has been pretty kind to death stranding i think it has pretty overall good scores but if you look at user reviews across the internet people are mad at this game there is some real anger at kojima and you know the walking simulator shit we've already gone over but there's a lot of people that don't like the story either and i think those people are bullshitting and i think they never even got to the story i think they quit like a couple hours in or whatever yeah. maybe not even played it they might not even played the game they're just kojima haters which there are a lot <laughs> i don't of know why would you even pick up the game <laughs> yeah. well it's weird every time a kojima game comes out you see these same people just come out and deride it no matter what like i heard it with mgs4 mgs5 and and now with Death, Death Stranding. I don't know. Dude, all those Melgar Salts were great. I, don't know. I was about to say three, four, and five were amazing. But I was just like, one through five were amazing. Yeah, all of them, yeah. yeah. yeah <laughs> Dude, I'll one-up you. The original Metal Gear for NES was amazing. I fucking love that game. And uh, I guess uh, my final question for this review to you is, who is Sam's BB? In the beginning of the game, it felt like BB was sort of mysterious. Like he was supposed to, essentially they convinced you that BB was the prototype BB. But then later on in the, what we just talked about with Cliff's ending, you find out that Norman Reedus was the prototype BB. And that immediately invalidates what you heard about Norman Reedus as BB. So who the fuck is Sam's BB? <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure Sam's BB is Sam. Okay, so that's interesting. So you think that this is like a an Ouroboros thing, the the snake eating its own tail, and that BB is Sam, and Sam is BB, and that Gilmo del Toro loved BB so much because he loved Sam so much. Well, so from what we understand, yeah, see, that's what I'm talking about. Now you're picking up what I'm putting down, man. There was some really weird shit going on there. <laughs> Love triangle type shit, but anyways. A BB needs a still mother. And we know that that's how he got his last name was Lisa Bridges or whatever. Cliff was not a Bridges. And then he gets shot, gets picked up by Bridget on the beach, and then brought to the regular reality. How see there's some there's definitely some plot holes they just know it. Now I won't even call them plot holes. They just didn't even explain it. They just they doesn't even bother to fucking try to explain it. So really, it's hard. I just assumed that it was Sam. Yeah. Uh, but now that I'm thinking about it, that's I don't know why I came to that conclusion because there's no reason to think that. There's no evidence to no. assume that that is Sam. No. And so, so essentially, the entire game until the very, 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 very last minute, you think BB is the prototype BB, and then they pull oh, the rug out from under oh. you, and that you find out that you are the prototype BB, and it totally just makes you question everything with the your BB with Sam's BB. Oh, maybe it's the other way around i get it now now that you find out why you're having the memories because you were shot while you were a, BB, a potential bb maybe that's why you were getting the memories when you plugged right. into your bb i get it now that yeah. makes sense yeah your bb okay. did not have those memories those, they were those coming were from you yes yes exactly uh. <laughs> so uh. so here's my theory and i have no idea if this is true or not and we'll probably never find out i think that sam's bb is clip i think that the reason that his bb BB makes him remember this shit is because it's Cliff and that it's reconnecting him to his father and making him see what happened with his father when he was a BB. And it's like a sort of a, like a what comes first, the chicken and the egg type situation. And what this would say is that Amelie, her, one of her final things that she did was that she repatriated Cliff as a BB for Sam to get him to the end of the game. 
and to make him remember all this stuff and to, to make this all kind of function with all the gears turning. Because in the beginning, they make you think BB is essential for you continuing through this game. Like without BB, you're nothing. Without BB, you won't remember anything. Nothing's going to happen. BB is integral, essential. And the only thing I can think to myself as to why this would be the case is that BB connects him to his past so that he can remember who Amelie is, who he is, who his father is. That's heavy. If that's it, I'm really disappointed that they didn't even try to attempt to explain that. I'd be disappointed. All right. Well, uh, I guess that that does it. Uh, Do you have any closing thoughts you want to make before we give our final review ratings? Yes, I have another excerpt from the Dino Crisis fan page. All right. (laughs) Never mind. (laughs) Strike that from the record. World's not ready. All right. Well, uh, so... I love this game, but I love it more as a movie than I love it as a game. If it weren't for the story, I would probably be giving out a much different review. But my final score is going to be a Jack Nicholson. I think this is a great game. I think it's one of Kojima's best storylines, and that's saying something. But the the gameplay clearly falls short, and I cannot call this a masterpiece. My heart wants to call it a masterpiece, But this is a game. We're reviewing a video game right now, not a movie. And as a video game, it has major flaws that I cannot ignore. So what say you, Broadcaster Nichols? You know, this game from the get-go, I really just wanted to love every part of it. I was just hyped up about it. And I had the rose-tinted goggles a lot on a lot longer than I wanted to. But at the end, I think I can say without any bias that this game is poorly put together. And is the glue that holds us together is the storyline. And it's an excellent holding glue that made this game pass at an A. And I almost want to say an A minus. I almost don't want to say it's a Jack. I almost want to call it Heath Ledger. I if really story, do. If the story didn't pick up the way it did at the yeah. end, it would have definitely been a Heath yeah, Ledger but, or maybe even lower. Because yeah. calling it a Heath Ledger seems like a disservice to the storyline. Because the storyline was the fucking game. That's what it was. And that's how that's why I'm convinced that's what I'm convincing myself of as I give 